Well, good afternoon. Welcome everyone to this rural development workshop and work session. Today is April 18th, 2019, and uh, we have almost a full house oh, here. I we hear. Have, uh, Vice Chair Gordon is in route, and I think about to join us any moment. And without further ado, let me um, turn this meeting over to Dr. Jenkins to introduce our subjects. Dr. Jenkins, you're recognized. You're very relaxed. Relax. Okay. Just starting. We are just starting. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, it is that season once again. We are in Rural Development Workshop concerning the rezoning for Site 83 and Site 20. We will take them separately. Uh, Dr. McGowan and her team will lead us through. Thank you, Dr. Jenkins, and good evening, board members. Prior good to evening. beginning our presentation, I'd like to take an opportunity to introduce student enrollment staff with me that will be presenting this evening. Next to me is Stacy Neal, and at the end is Dr. Andy Westerman. All rezonings, no matter Ms. how. McGowan, if yes, I could, if you can pull your mic a little Again? bit closer. I'm sorry, I thought I had it up for you. Uh, and it may be picking up. I know that we record these, so I always want to make sure people can hear us, and I'm not sure if it's picking up well enough in the room. So thank you. Okay, thank you, and I apologize. No, no problem. Thank you. Someday I'll get it at the right spot. Okay. All rezonings, no matter how small, follow school board policy JC. To describe the scope of the rezoning, we use the terms technical, targeted, and relief school rezoning. A technical rezoning has no students involved. A targeted rezoning is a selected area that does have students involved. Uh, a relief school rezoning, a new school is coming. This policy is followed whether we rezone for a new school, a neighborhood, or no children at all. For a quick review of school board policy JC, our first slide shows the first four steps. And our next slide shows our public meetings. We have a community meeting. We have the rural development workshop, the public hearing, and then the storage of our rezoning notebook. We have a naming convention for all new relief schools. If we look at our first one, which is 83 ES. SE3. The 83 shows the property, the real estate property number. The E shows the school type, in this case elementary. The SE is the learning community, southeast, and the 3 is the school board member district. For this set of rezoning, our timeline shows that our community meeting was March 7th. Tonight, April 18th, is the Rural Development Workshop, and the public hearing will be held May 14th. The grandfather transfer has been put into place to ease transition of rezoning for families. To be eligible for this transfer, a student must fit into one of the three following three criteria. Rezone twice by OCPS during a school level, rezone from an existing school to an existing school, or be a rising fifth or eighth grader when the rezone school relief school opens up. Families may apply for the grandfather transfer on our website, and they have till May 31st to do so. Transportation is not provided, and each student must meet the transfer criteria. We provide several ways to get community feedback. We have an electronic survey, which is on our website, and on your screen you can see the two links. We also ask for community feedback by email, or the neighborhoods can provide us a petition. Our first relief school that we'll be discussing this evening is 83 ESE3. And here's a map that shows the land and where it's located. And we'll start with looking at the development in the area. The red lines are the boundary lines for the 2019-20 school year. And we'll be looking at Moss Park, Sunblaze, North Lake Park. 
the arrow shows where the new relief school will be located. And as we look at this, the green plats, the green block, block, wow, the green shaded areas is where development is underway. The purple areas are areas that have been platted and we will see rooftops in the near future. The pink area is planned and we will see it in the future. Let's take a look at the student enrollment over the years. This is the student population in 2013-14, this school year, and the projected for 2020. At this time, Dr. Westerman will present the options for 83 ESE3. Good evening. I'll be going through the three options for rezoning in this area. The first slide shows our current zones. The red lines are the current elementary school boundaries for each zone. <coughs> the peach area is McCoy Elementary School with a, pro a permanent program capacity of 711 and projection of 589 for 2020. The purple area is Three Points Elementary School with a per permanent program capacity of 654 and projection of 453 for 2020. The pink area is Sunblaze Elementary School with a permanent program capacity of 769 and projection of 1,300 for 2020. The light blue area is North Lake Park Elementary School with a permanent program capacity of 830 and projection of 974 for 2020. The orange area is Moss Park Elementary School with a permanent program capacity of 796 and a projection of 1,202 for, uh, for 2020. 83E SE3 is located in the current Sunblaze Elementary Zone. The next slide shows and hash marks the proposed area for rezoning. The areas from McCoy to Three Points is a technical piece with no students. Areas from North Lake Park and Sunblaze are moving to the new 83 school. Areas from Sunblaze are moved to North Lake Park. And areas from Moss Park are moved to Sunblaze. The next slide shows the newly zoned colored areas with hashed areas showing what is affected. Please be reminded the red areas represent the current zones and the colors show the newly proposed zones. Peach is McCoy Elementary School. Its pro permanent program capacity is 711. The proposed residence right now at 793 and projected in 2020 at 589. In purple is Three Points Elementary School. The PPC is 654. The proposed residence right now at 664 and projected in 2020 at 453. Yellow is the new 83E SE3 school with a PPC of 830, the proposed residence right now at 719, and projected in 2020 at 664. Pink is the Sunblaze Elementary School zone with a, a PPC of 769, the proposed residence right now at 779, and projected in 2020 at 874. Light blue is North Lake Park Elementary School with PPC is 830. The proposed residence right now at 928 and projected in 2020 at 893. Orange is Moss Park Elementary School with PPC at 796. The proposed residence right now at 951 and projected in 2020 at 987. Now, during the uh, process of updating maps from the community meeting to this rural development workshop, an updated set of maps showed that the proposed lines would have split a community. Though no students reside in this area yet, this amended map shows a piece that would have moved from Moss Park to Sunblaze that will remain with Moss Park. It is marked with hashes and outlined in black and Carol circling now. None of the rest of the map changes. If option one amended is approved, this is how the new zones would look. We go on to our data table. 
The first column has the school name with a permanent program capacity. Second and third columns represent the school enrollments on October 15th, 2018 and February 15th, 2019. And also the percentage for race as white, black, and other with ethnicity as non-Hispanic and Hispanic. For example, Moss Park Elementary School has a PPC of 796, an enrollment of 1,055 on October 15th, and a race breakdown of 90% white, or sorry, 80% white, 9% black, and 11% other, with 53% non-Hispanic and 47% Hispanic. The next column contains the number of students residing in the current zone along with the projected residing number of students in 2020. Again, for Moss Park Elementary School, this is 1,133 students residing now and 1,202 projected residing for 2020. The next column contains proposed number of students residing in the zone, race and ethnicity information, and the projected enrollment for 2020. Continuing with Moss Park, the proposed number residing in the new zone is 951 with 82% white, 9% black, and 9% other, 58% non-Hispanic, and 42% Hispanic with a projection of 987 students enrolled in 2020. The next five columns list current and proposed percentage of students who scored one and two in FSA math and English. It's 8% current for proposed math and 9% for current and proposed English. For those who qualify for free and reduced meals, the current and proposed are both 29%. Those students in the exceptional student education program are currently at 9% and the proposed would be 10%. The students in the English language learners program are currently at 14% and the posed, proposed would be 12%. McCoy and Three Points Elementary Schools in this uh, table are grayed out as they are for boundary lines only and affect no students. I'll give everyone some time to review the data table. Looking at option two, we first start with the option one amended map. We see the colored area showing the new zones and the red lines represent the current zones. This next slide shows the area that changed from option one amended to option two. Carol's circling the area there. The hashed area would remain with Moss Park instead of moving to Sunblaze. The next slide, we could see the proposed new zones. Only Sunblaze and Moss Park would have changes in the demographics. Sunblaze has a current proposed residing students of 649 and projected enrollment of 752 in 2020. Moss Park would have a proposed currently residing number of 1,081 with a projected enrollment of 1,109 in 2020. If option two is approved, this is what the new zones would look like. This slide shows the data table for option two. Reminder that Sunblaze and Moss Parks are the only schools that change from option one. And give everyone time to review the data table. Starting with option three now, we first start looking at option two and we'll show the changes to option three. The proposed areas are hashed. Dr. McGowan circling the areas now. The north area west of Portofino Drive would change to North Lake Park. The area east of Portofino Drive and south of Kristen Park Drive would change to Sunblaze. And the area south of Imaginary Way would move from Moss Park to Sunblaze. The hashed areas are now colored to match the new ones, new zones. 
And now the proposed zones are colored in with the red lines representing the current school zones. Again, during the process of updating our maps from the community meeting to this rural development workshop, an updated set of maps showed the proposed lines would have split a community. Though no students reside in this area, this amended map shows a piece that would have been moved from Moss Park to Sunblaze that will remain with Moss Park. It's marked with hashes and outlined in black. Dr. McGowan's pointing to the area. I pointed too fast. <laughs> None of the rest of the map changes for option three. For the new 83 school, the proposed resides is 719, and the projected enrollment for 2020 is 664. For Sunblaze, the proposed resides is 863, and the projected enrollment is 925 for 2020. For North Lake Park, the proposed resides is 844, and the projected enrollment is 848 for 2020. Finally, for Moss Park, the proposed resides is 951, and the proposed projected enrollment for 2020 is 987. If option three amended is approved, this is what the new zones would look like. This slide shows the data table for option three amended. I'll give everyone time to review the data table. This is an overview of all three maps showing the areas involved. This data table compares the three options in terms of students residing, students projected in 2020, and the students projected in 2022, which is the year before the next relief school is planned to open in the area. The feedback from the community is shown on the slide. That was uh, up until April 15th. Since then, we've had 31 more families to provide feedback. The final numbers are for option one, 33 in support, 117 oppose. For option two, we have support of 61 and oppose of 89. And finally, for option three, there were 82 in support and 68 that opposed. Sorry, can you run through those the new numbers one more time for us? Sure. And those numbers are um, how recent? The ones you read? Uh, as read of them? today. As, as of, of today. Noon. Oh, if you can go through them one more time for us. Yes. Option one. Option one, support 33, oppose 117. Option two, support 61, oppose 89. And finally, for option three, support 82 and oppose 68. Thank you. All right, before, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry, Ms. McCown, we're going to take up both of these. I'm sorry, we're going to take up. We want the recommendation. Pardon me? Recommendation. You do want a recommendation from the staff? I'm sorry. Well, we want your recommendation. Yes, I'm sorry. Thank you. The superintendent staff recommendation is option three amended. The data table. And here's the data table showing the numbers. Give everyone a moment to review that. 
And that concludes my presentation. Dr. Jenkins. Thank you. Okay, uh, we have. Can you go back to the last slide? This one? No. The table. The table. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, and yes, and just hold that up. No we problem. have um, two rezonings we're taking up, and yes, we are. Um, as I understand it, we're going to hear presentations on both before we take input from the public. It's, I would. No. That's what I w was told, but it would make sense to me to hear from the member of the public which wants to discuss this now while this is very fresh on our mind. Okay? All right, wonderful, thank you. I knew we do have one person here. If there's anyone else here for this particular rezoning, please, this is your opportunity to speak. If you can come up to um, the, the desk over to my right, you, my left, I guess. Um, otherwise, we have Miss Northcutt. Did Ms. Northcutt's already filled out a speaker card. Yeah. Ms. Northcutt, if you want to come right over here. I wasn't sure if we had anybody other than you here for this, so if there's anybody else, this would be your time to speak. Ms. Northcutt, if you could give your name and address for the record, and after your name and address, you'll have three minutes. Okay. My name is Marta Northcutt. My address is 9836 Secret Cove Lane. My children go to Moss Park Elementary School. And I'm here speaking on behalf of the parents for Moss Park Elementary, many of whom couldn't be here because it is during working hours. It's a lovely neighborhood school built to house only 800 students. But every one of the last 10 years, we have been over capacity, many years over capacity by hundreds of students. And many parents still remember the nightmare of having 1,300 students crammed into that little school. We had teen teachers, we had kids eating lunch at 10.30 in the morning just to get them all through the cafeteria, and even people who didn't have children knew that you did not leave the house after three o'clock because you could not get out of the neighborhood because of the horrific traffic. Once the relief school came in, it was better. However, within two years, we were over capacity again. Now, we're planning to rezone, and all these options, all of them, leave us over capacity. However, the worst option of all is number two. It leaves the school built for 800 with a whopping 1,100 children. That's 300 over capacity, roughly a third more than this school was built for. Now take into account that by your own numbers in the 10-year plan, we will be adding approximately 50 more students a year to this school every year until the new relief school is built, which is going to leave us very close to that nightmare 1300 before we get a new relief school, leaving my son at 60% over capacity by the time he graduates from that school. And so now we need to prepare for that increase now. You can see on your maps all the building that they're planning to do. So we need to plan for that now. Now, just to add a little bit of insult to our injury here, option two also leaves the new school and Sun Blaze under capacity with plenty of room to stretch out, which is really unfair to our children. So we're very frustrated at Moss Park that we are constantly taking the brunt of the growth in this area. It is a high growth area. We know it's coming. And yet the schools are, are kind of slow in coming and we're always over capacity. So I would like to urge you to ease our overcrowding problem. Please choose option three, which will leave us with less crowding in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. All right, any other speakers on this rezoning? All right, thank you. Then I will open this up to a board discussion, and uh, do we want to be begin with Ms. Co Colbert, Member Colbert. Thank you, Dr. McGowan, to you and your team for this presentation. It is most difficult in these high growth areas, and I, and I appreciate the speaker as well for coming and speaking on, your, on behalf of your community. Um, in looking at this, uh, one, I'm going to defer to Member Lopez as the new school will fall in my district, but all of the students affected are in Ms. Lopez's uh, district. Uh, my personal opinion, um, I would recommend option three as amended, but I would very much like to hear from Member Lopez. All right, thank you. Member Lopez, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you um, board member Linda Cover, um, I agree with you. Um, thank you for coming and express your your opinion and your feedback. Um, I believe that I heard that um, option three as well wa um, was supported by the community as well. Yes, ma'am. Yes. And is recommended by the superintendent. Okay. 
So I believe the same way. It is not fair for most part to be overcrowded all the time. So I also supported um, option option three as well. Um, all the schools that are impacted is in Lake Nona. Okay. Um, this option is also giving the opportunity to some place to a little bit of help with the traffic um, situation that they are facing as well because they're gonna have less students. So yeah, my support is for option three. All right, any other board members have comments? All right, so we hear, I hear um, consensus between member Cobert and member Lopez who both um, have either the school or the students in their district for, for uh, option three. Support by uh, recommendation by the staff. Any members of the board here have a different opinion? All right, if not, then we have consensus on this option, and we will um, move on to the next item. Dr. Jenkins, you're recognized. All right, our next uh, workshop is concerning uh, rezoning for property 20, which is in an elementary school in the Southwest and in Ms. Gould's area again. <laughs> School board member that is the four for District 4. Dr. McGowan. Thank you. 20 ESW4 is located at the south end of International Drive. So if we look at our map and look at our development again, we'll start with where the new school is located, assuming I can get this thing to move. Anyway, it's where the arrow is. This long zone that I'm going around is the current Tangelo Park zone. This is the Osceola County line. The other schools are Waterbridge are the two big ones with this one. If we look at ours, we have that the green areas are the developments that are underway. The purple areas are being platted and the pink areas are planned. And if we look at our student population, we take a glance at that from 2013. Then we look for this year. And then we look at our projections for 2020. A lot of growth coming. At this time, Ms. Neal will take us through the options for 20E SW4. Good evening. I am presenting the options for 20E SW4. First, I would like to go over the current schools and their zones outlined in red and point out the colors of each on all the options. I would also like to mention for each school represented, there will be a corresponding text box with the school's permanent program capacity and projections for the 2020 school year. Tangelo Park Elementary is in purple and has a permanent program capacity of 606 and the projection for 2020 is 840. Sadler Elementary is in orange and has a permanent program capacity of 761 and the projection for 2020 is 845. Winegard Elementary is in gray and has a permanent program capacity of 722 and its projection for 2020 is 759. Waterbridge Elementary is in green and has a permanent program capacity of 814 with a projection of 1373 in 2020. West Creek Elementary is in pink and has a permanent program capacity of 658 and its projection for 2020 is 909. This next slide, areas have been outlined and hashed so that you will be able to identify where the changes are occurring. To start, there are two areas in Sadler Elementary, a section of Winegard, Waterbridge, West Creek, and Tangelo. Option one has the southern tip and eastern portion of Sadler being rezoned to Tangelo Park, along with an area from Winegard. With this change, Tangelo Park Elementary's current proposed residing number of students is 567, and the projected students for 2020 is 572. Sadler Elementary proposed residing is 829, and its projected for 2020 is 758. 
Wine Guard's proposed residing is 807, and the 2020 projections is 751. Water Bridges zone will be reduced, and students will be rezoned to the new school 20E SW4, and the proposed resides is 928, with the projections for 2020 being 843. 20 e SW4, the new school zone, will consist of the southern part of Tangela Park, the western part of Waterbridge, and the northern part of West Creek Elementary. At this time, I would like to point out this large portion of West Creek that is, or looks like green polka dots. This is uninhabited wetlands and will not involve any students. The new school 20E SW4's permanent program capacity is 830. With this newly created zone, the proposed resides is 974. Projected for the 2020 school year is 1059. And West Creek's proposed resides and projected remains the same. If option one is chosen, this slide shows the proposed new zones. Here's the data table. West Creek is grayed out, even though it is involved in the option. Remember, there are no children involved. I will quickly go over the chart as Dr. Westman, Westerman did earlier. Sadler Elementary has a permanent program capacity of 761. The enrollment for October 2018 was 827 with the white, black, other breakdown percentage is 73%, 21, and 6. Non-Hispanic, Hispanic, 22%, and 78%. The enrollment for February 15, 2019 is here. With 842 enrollment, 73 white, 20% black, 7% other with 22% non-Hispanic, 78% Hispanic. The number of students residing in the area is 879, mm. projected for the 2020, 845. Proposed resides is 829. The white, black, other, 72%, 22%, 6%. Projected students for 22, sorry, did I do Hispanic, non-Hispanic, non Hispanic, 24%, 76%. And the students projected for 2020, 758. The next one shows the FSA math level one and two students current and proposed, both 17%. FSA ELA one and twos current and proposed, 18% for current, proposed 17%. The free and reduced meals, current 67%, proposed 66%. Exceptional student education, current and proposed, both at 9%. English language learners, current and proposed, 60%. I'll give you time to review the rest of the table. This slide shows option one. Oh, oh, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry, forgive me. This slide is option one, and notice the changes are outlined again in black and hashed. There is a tiny portion of Shingle Creek Elementary, which is in white, which would now be rezoned or move into Tangela Park Elementary. The corner of Sadler Elementary will remain in Sadler, and these are the changes for option two. Shingle Creek is involved, and in this option, the text box has Shingle Creek with a proposed resides of 777, projected for the 2020 school year 684. Sadler's proposed resides is 879, and projected for 2020, 803. Tangelo has a proposed resides of 687 and projected for the 2020 school year 696. If option two is approved, this is how the new school zone would look.
Here's the data table with West Creek Elementary grayed out and remaining the same. I'll give you a few minutes to review, a few, or I'll give you time to review. Option two is here. The areas that are outlined and hashed will, will show the changes from option two to option three. Tangelo has a proposed resides of 567 and projection for 2020, 572. Sadler has a proposed resides of 829 and projected for 2020, 758. This option includes taking the bottom of 20 ESW4 and moving it into Sand Lake Elementary. Sand Lake has a permanent program capacity of 768, proposed resides 564, and projected for the 2020 school year 589. This new school will have a proposed resides of 974 and projected 1059. This option may look familiar because it is option one with Sand Lake. And if this option is chosen, this is how the zone will look. Here's the data table. Please, um, Member Colbert. This table, yes, the numbers for the population for 20 are different than on the map that you just showed in this option. Well, bananas. So in looking at 20, it should be your this. projected students are 971. On the map, it shows 1059. It's, it's the 971. It's the 971. Okay, so that does My relieve apologies. 20. Okay, by moving that section into Sand Lake, that does help to relieve 20. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> I'm glad. <sighs> okay. And that's why Ms. McGowan did that. <laughs> she, that was her test, yes. Okay. Here is option three. The areas, once again, are outlined and hashed to ch show the changes for option four. Tangelo with a proposed resides of 687 and projected for 2020, keep going. 696. If this option looks familiar to, it's option two, it's option two with the inclusion of Sand Lake. And with the same error that you saw before. Here's the data table for you to review. Option four is on the screen and the next map shows the outlined and hashed areas we are moving for option five. You will notice we are taking the upper portion of the new school 20E SW4 and moving those students to Sand Lake and leaving the lower portion of 20E SW4 in 20. 
Tangelo will have a proposed resides of 687 and projected for the new for the 2020 school year 696. Shingle Creek will have proposed resides of 777 and projected for the 2020 school year 684. The new school 20 ESW4 will have a proposed resides 877 and projected 2020 935. Sand Lake has proposed resides 600 and it's projected for 2020 625. If option five is approved, the new zone would look like this. The data table for you to review. Here are the side-by-side -side comparisons or overview. Options one and three are the same with Sand Lake as the change. Options two and four are the same with the addition of Sand Lake and option five. Here's the data table with the students currently residing and, and projected enrollment for you to review. West Creek is grayed out. No students are involved. As of April 15th, or on April 15th, we had community feedback with one family. Since then, as of noon today, we had additional six. Option one, there was one in support, six opposed. Option two, one support, six opposed. Option three, one support, six opposed. Option four, two in support, five opposed. Option five, five in support, two opposed. The superintendent staff recommendation is option five. Here's the data table for you to review. This will conclude my presentation Dr. Jenkins. Okay, board members. Can you put that table back up? Yes, ma'am. The one, the table? The table. Okay, my Charlie. apologies. There we go. Okay, thank you. We'll begin with Member Cobert. Chair, Member Gould's button was delayed. She really had punched in first. I'll defer to her first. I'm we sorry. heard mine click first. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, while I am the lucky beneficiary of the real estate, most of the uh, children affected are uh, affected in Ms. Cobert and Ms. Gordon's <laughs> areas. And um, I, I will say that I like five the best currently, but I'd like to hear the comments from the two board members that really have uh, the bulk of the students affected. All right, thank you. Next, we'll hear then from member, I'm sorry, ignore that member, Kester Dental, member Cobert. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so we definitely need to look at this with a global perspective because it does affect three different districts. But for me, 
Option five seems the most balanced, and I would go with the staff's recommendation of option five. All right, thank you. I, am I correct that Member Gallo, did you want to be recognized? Okay. Member Gallo, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just have a question. Oh, I actually have two questions. Number one, it, it appears that West Creek is going to be overcrowded in 2020, so why was it West Creek considered when we were rezoning? Because the new school was going to be overcrowded and there's a whole lot of growth in the new school area and it would just be moving, overcrowding to overcrowding. Thank you. And yes, then ma'am. Why so few families <laughs> responding? Um, I don't we know. Had a lot of meetings. <laughs> we, we, okay. we did have the community meeting. They have had the meetings for the, um, the building. We sent out a second Connect Orange message to try to get more folks involved. I think in some respects they might be happy that they're not going to be so overcrowded. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Perfect. Thank you. Always a good sign when the notices went out and you have little feedback. Somebody's doing a good job. Member Gordon. Well, it's not always over, Madam Chair, until the fat lady sings. <laughs> all right. And that's when they really, when the rubber meets the road. Okay. First of all, I do want to commend. Um, uh, oh my God, I, I do want to commend Dr. McGowan and Ms. Rinaldo Neal and Dr. McGowan and, and your entire staff uh, that, that, have worked, that have worked extremely hard with us and met with us in all kinds of places, in the grocery store, the bank, or wherever <laughs> we could find a seat to go over these plans. Um, just remarkable, Dr. Jenkins. I think we sent this back to you so many times and either Ms. Colbert was unhappy or Ms. Gould was unhappy. Uh, I was very unhappy, and, um, and, and my reason for that is because the, the way we had proposed it, you were going to leave me empty. And I think for the knowledge that your staff possess, and Ms. Colbert and um, uh, Board Member Gould, without our even communicating with each other, other than Ms. Ms. Colbert sent her information to um, one of the community meetings, which was very helpful. And, uh, Board Member Gould spoke on her behalf because she could not make it there. But then go uh, by our being in that public forum, open forum, Board Member Gould and I saw some changes that needed to be made. I did not know we could make it and we did get a lot of input from the parents. But I wanted to say I thank you from the bottom of my heart and Dr. Jenkins, your steadfastness and your intuitiveness with your staff and going back wanting to take a look at a change because I was up here on pins and needle um, because of the last outcome I saw, but to hear my colleagues say that they're pleased with the option of the superintendent staff recommendation is wonderful. And I have to give a little story of this board. There was a time when it was the superintendent's recommendation. And the superintendent said, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm, I, I hired those people, and they're the ones to bring it to us. And it only becomes the superintendent's after it's approved by the board. <laughs> so they, she'll get the credit for it. But I, I love it um, because uh, you came back with great recommendations. I do want to commend you on the gerrymandering because the lines were not good when it came to the three of us. It was so gerrymandered, I just say, what the devil? Okay, and I, I do want to thank you for the gerrymandering and getting those lines. You know, that was a, that's one of your goals that you all have worked on to bring all of those lines together. And you've done a remarkable job. And, and when Mr. Um, Westman came on board and with Ms. Neal working and a doctor, the other, I don't want to slight her. Uh, uh, Renata Perot. Yes, 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 working with us, everybody, to just work so hard to make this happen. Um, one other thing, I'm, I'm a little disappointed in the farms because Tangelo end up with um, so many of the farms, a little bit much more than we desired. But that's the way the cookie will crumble on this one because Dr. Jenkins try her best along with the Rosen Foundation and so many cooperative business to go in there and give us what we want. So I don't want to leave it like that, but I want the board to pay attention to that so that those sitting in the audience that work with teaching and learning would see that there will be a greater need now because you've given us a few more 
And that means if you, you enhance that farms, you, you put us in another struggling position. And you have to look at that we have been under the S, we've been in A school, but we have also been under STO and the future uh, Teach for America teachers, and, and I'm not very pleased of what's all happening there because the teachers are only there like two years and then they make another commitment. So I'm, I'm working with several of the staff members and the superintendent now to see how that's going. But I do want this board to keep that in consideration, that you're giving us a little more problems, uh, and I don't want to say problems, but learning struggles. Mm -hmm. So you got to look at what kind of resources we're going to give as a board to the superintendent that this school can get back to being an A school. I think I made that perfectly clear there. And the last thing, the grandfathering in. If those students do not want to leave Shingle Creek and go to Tangelo, uh, how, uh, how far out have you reached it? And I can't believe that I have about 16 seconds left. <laughs> And I'm finished. <laughs> okay. And I'm for district. I'm, I'm for district five, and I'm going for superintendent staff recommendation. Five. All right. Whoa. One second left. Whoa. <laughs> I'm trying. Okay. Um, so the we the answer the grandfather. Yes, absolutely. Before we come to that, let me just point of order here. Um, I do not have any speaker cards for this rezoning, but I still want to make sure that if there are any members of the public that are here for this rezoning that you have this opportunity now before the board reaches consensus all right wonderful so um vice chair has a question well actually a compliment on the gerrymandering mm -hmm, but, but a question the grandfathering. Okay. the grandfathering thank you okay um if students are going from an existing school to an existing school such as shingle creek the tangelo the families can apply for the grandfathered transfer to remain at Shingle Creek. Uh, for this rezoning, that would open up next February and run through May 31st. And we do give a courtesy call to all families rezoned to remind them they were rezoned and that the time frame and who can apply. Excellent, excellent, excellent. So um, I'm going to I'm going to wrap this up. I think in just a minute here, but I think uh, one of the, the points that uh, the vice chair made. Um, and I've, I've seen a lot of heads nodding, and um, as we reach consensus on this, I think that the, the ratio of um, children on free and reduced lunch was a very valid point. And um, I, for one, want to support your concern and desire to make sure that we have allocated extra resources. Those children are every bit as capable of learning as anybody else. No doubt about that. We've proven that time and time again. But having the extra resources um, in that school devoted to that is very important to their success. So um, with if there aren't any objections to that, I've heard two members express uh, support for number five as well as the staff. Anybody opposed to number five? With that, we have consensus. Anybody opposed to, um, and it's not a motion, obviously, but the position of the vice chair on the issue of making sure that we allocate the necessary resources to any school in a situ situation similar. Not that I think, um, to be honest with you, not that I think that that direction needs to come from the board, because I have confidence the superintendent would be doing that anyway. But I think it's important that, um, as a member representing that, uh, that school, that it's important to be said. So thank you for saying it. All right, um, anything further on this matter that we need to take up? Thank you. Then, uh, thank you very much. Clap, Great clap, job. Clap, job. Clap, job. Clap, job. <laughs> I don't know how you did it. Yes. All right, our next work session is the uh, School Board Code of Conduct, JIC. And Dr. Jenkins, I will turn it over to you to introduce the subject. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. This is the first open discussion among board members regarding our Code of Conduct. It will move after this into official uh, uh, work workshop. Uh, this is the first time for the board to collectively give any uh, direction beyond what you have shared in your one-on-one -on -one meetings regarding our code of conduct. Who's beginning? Hi. Um, good evening, everybody. Let me 
move that a little closer. Um, we're going to go over uh, JIC, Policy JIC, and the Code of Student Conduct. We're going to review I'm the I'm sorry. Please introduce the entire I team. I apologize. Um, I am Sarah Kopeski. I'm with Legal Services. I am Demiki Joyner. I work with the high school. Delilah Hernandez, K-8. Valencia Boyd, high school department. Thank and you. Charlie Russ, K-8. Wonderful. Thank you. And we do have one other area administrator who could not be here um, today, Mr. Bulliard. So he is also in the high school department. Um, so we will be Am I right? Is he, is his uh, daughter getting married today? No? No. Okay. <laughs> oh. He's oh. Because I told him I didn't know him and where are you coming from and why are you coming up here. Somebody's afraid of you? No. Imagine that. Somebody is afraid of Member Gordon? I don't know why. I don't understand that. Imagine that. Okay. I can assure you he adores you, Miss Gordon. <laughs> so um, we will be reviewing the current code of student conduct. We have met with board members individually and have gone over it. So as opposed to reading um, the slides line by line, we're going to give you kind of a summary because we've already um, met with you. But if you have any questions, of course, feel free to ask. So our agenda is an overview, timeline, summary of the actions, and then questions and discussion. The purpose of this presentation is to review board policy JIC and the Code of Student Conduct, also called the Code in short. Section 1006.07 of the Florida Statutes requires the adoption of a code for, and for the code to be presented at the beginning of each school year. Our tentative schedule, um, we went to Cabinet for this work session on April 1st. We are here today on April 18th for the work session. We go back to Cabinet for rural development, and that will be with our red line changes for the upcoming 2019-2020 school year, and that will be on May 6th. And then we'll come back again for a rural development workshop to go over the red line changes on June 4th, 2019. Um, if it is approved, it will go through on June 11th, 2019 at the school board meeting, and then go into effect the first day of the 2019-2020 school year, which is August 12th, 2019. Um, J board policy JIC, which is entitled the Code of Student Conduct. The purpose um, is to review board policy JIC. An action summary is to present an overview of board policy JIC to school board members. We have a Code of Student Conduct um, that was adopted by the board and published to students in the community. It is reviewed on a quarterly basis with our, all of our students in our schools and it provides disciplinary action procedures and rights of students. There's a section in JIC that pertains to student detention, searches, and seizures. Um, essentially, the main part of that is that we may detain a student and question them if we believe they are in violation of the Code of Student Conduct. However, to search them, we do need reasonable suspicion um, to do that. Uh, reasonable, reasonable suspicion is not required to search OCPS property, so such as lockers or laptops. We don't need reasonable suspicion. There's also a section on student control and supervision that pertains to basically our jurisdiction lines as to when we can discipline students. So it would include any acts that occur on campus, um, at a school-sponsored activity, while on the bus, or school-sponsored uh, transportation, um, or on any other just jurisdictional areas permitted by Florida statutes. So that may be if a student is um, being bullied outside of school and it has a substantial effect on their academic performance in school, we can actually take jurisdiction for that. We also have a section on zero tolerance for school-related violent crime that's required to be adopted by Florida statutes, and it essentially is that um, we have no tolerance for violent crimes. Um, all of those need to be reported to law enforcement, and they would include things such as having a firearm on campus, sexual battery, battery, things like that. Um, there's a section on disciplinary school transfers, and that's established by the unsafe school choice option. We currently don't have any unsafe schools uh, that meet the criteria for that, but that would be something where um, if there are several firearms on the school campus, 
all the time, or if more than a certain percentage of students have been expelled for expellable offenses at a specific school. There is a section on bring your own device. Um, students shall not use any personally owned electronic device in a manner that poses a threat to academic integrity, disrupts the learning environment, or violates the privacy rights of others. Um, and then there's a section on hazing, which is also required to be adopted by Florida statutes, and it essentially prohibits all of our students from participating in any form of hazing. And I will turn it over to Mickey Joyner for the Code of Student Conduct. Okay, um, we have two ways that we acknowledge the Code of Student Conduct. We have a paper copy, and we also acknowledge it through Canvas, which is, which is on the student's digital device. Um, section one um, deals with public notice of parent rights regarding student records. On a FERPA, parents can inspect and amend um, discipline records. If parents um, want something to be, re want to remove the discipline record, we don't allow that, but they can um, amend. Also, Section 2 deals with student rights and responsibilities. Um, some of their rights include a safe and positive learning environment, to be informed regarding board policy and school rules about absenteeism and tardiness, also guidance, guidance services, grading policies, course curriculum, just to name a few. Um, we have Safe Harbor. Students can surrender an object that is prohibited by the code before an investigation begins. Also on section two, um, participation in extracurricular and co-curricular activities. Students who are suspended or expelled may not be eligible to participate in extra or co-curricular activities. Um, the board also has the authority to withheld participation. Students charged with um, felonies and certain disciplinary actions would be prevented from um, participating in extracurricular and co-curricular activities. Orange County has also adopted a dress code policy and these standards um, apply to all students. Transportation, students are required to follow the guidelines provided by transportation on all school sponsored activities. We have an internet policy. Students must follow the acceptable use agreement that has been established for educational purposes. Truancy, schools would, schools would not suspend a student for unexcused absences, but a student can be, can be disciplined for skipping and leaving campus without permission. Possession of illicit substances, um, according to state law, the unlawful possession, use, buying, selling of illicit drugs and or alcohol on school grounds is prohibited. Possession of firearms on OCPS property. Firearms and weapons are prohibited on school grounds except for law enforcement officers. We also have positive alternative suspension, school suspension, which we call PANS, and it's an alternative to out-of-school suspension. Simulated weapons. Students simulating a firearm or weapon while playing, which substantially disrupts the learning environment, may be disciplined. Student investigations. Schools are responsible for conducting an investigation for misconduct. However, students do not have to participate. Refusal to participate will not stop the school's investigation. We have four um, discipline levels, the offenses. Each level represents a more serious offense. I will go over the four levels. A level one offense are minor acts of misconduct, which could include classroom disruption, dress code, profanity, or minor harassment. The response code would be parent contact, could be a verbal reprimand, or it could be some sort of special work assignment. Level two offenses are more serious acts of misconduct. 
These offenses could include insubordination, open defiance, misconduct on school approved transportation, stealing, and electronic violation. The offenses response code could include um, restorative justice, pass, confiscation of unauthorized materials. The next level, level three offenses are major acts of misconduct. These offenses could include physical attack, extortion, possession of contraband, um, physical aggression on an employee. The response code for this particular offense could be a behavior plan or a contract. Again, restorative justice, Saturday school, or out of school suspension. Level, level four offenses are our most serious acts of misconduct. <coughs> Any level four act is grounds for expulsion and may result in a 10 day suspension. Um, offenses could include alcohol, arson, threats, um, drugs, firearms, destructive devices, sexual offenses, hazing, and larceny theft. The response code for this particular infraction, parental contact, suspension, you could be assigned to an alternative school or program, or it could result in expulsion from the school district. Within these offenses, levels one, two, and three, um, schools make those decisions um, when they're doing, com completing those referrals. Um, student is given a, a notice. They have an opportunity to present their side. The family also has a right to um, meet with the principal or designee to discuss the infraction. If they're not happy with the principal's decision, they can um, appeal to the error administrator to have the error administrator look over it to make sure due process was given to the student. <coughs> On the level four, um, again, student is given notice and they have an opportunity to present their side. Um, an error administrator convenes a DISMA team meeting. A manifestation portion is held for students who qualify for ESC services or have a 504 plan. The family may appeal the admin area administrator's decision to um, the hearing officer. If the family wants to continue to dispute, they may appeal before the school board. We also have um, a procedure in place for felon suspension or expulsion. A principal may suspend um, a student who has been formally charged with a felony off school property. If the um, felony charge has an adverse impact on the educational environment. There's also um, procedures for re-entry from a full um, exclusion. Students may appeal to the area superintendent for early re-entry to Positive Pathways Transition Center. Okay. Our next step is to work with board members OCPS employees and the community to make revisions to the Code of Student Conduct for the 19-2020 school year. That concludes the 2018-2019 code. We have um, input that was provided by board members as well as the community that we'd like to review now. All right, thank you. Um, I have a, actually a couple of questions on page three of our policy, it lists a number of things that um, the board shall do. Let me get out there. Um, it's under zero tolerance for school-related violent crime. It says that we have to define petty acts of, mis of misconduct. And I was trying to find where we defined petty acts of misconduct. Can you help me with that? Yes, ma'am. Um, we actually, it's not defined in this policy, but we can put it in this policy. Right now it's in our um, school justice partnership agreement. It is defined in there as to what petty acts of misconduct are. Um, they're essentially things that would not be criminal in nature. So, um, 
like our level one, level two, um, some of our level threes, those aren't necessarily criminal in nature. Um, so those would technically be petty acts of misconduct. So later on in this policy, it talks about, um, it does uh, allude to the fact that they're misdemeanors because it mentions that if there's multiple misdemeanors that they might be reported. Mm -hmm. So I kind of, I, I was concluding from that that maybe they were misdemeanors or there was some other definition. S the document, the agreement that you said they're in is what agreement? It's the school justice partnership agreement, the agreement that we have with our local law enforcement agencies. Okay, so that would have been an agreement that the board approved? Yes, ma'am. Um, yeah, I'm just trying to make sure that the, since it says the board shall, that the board has. Mm -hmm. um, the other, the other issue was something, and, and all of the, the shalls under here, are those all covered in that same agreement? Um, I saw them seem kind of obviously obvious to me, but it still says we have to define them. Um, I will review define the Define the criteria. If you'll look at, make it sure that, sure. that okay. Mm -hmm. yes, because again, I, I, again, some of them seem like they're just defined by virtue of the word, but given the close attention being paid these days to um, what school boards are doing, I wanna make sure that we're meeting every letter of the law. So the second issue was something that I um, discussed with with you all when we met, and, that, and I, I can't find where self-defense is defined. And, um, and Dr. Jenkins, I think we may have talked about this uh, yeah. I want to. We all come, I think, to the board bringing our own life experiences, and it's a great opportunity when you have a board that where you have teachers that bring that experience, and you have parents that bring their experience. And overall, my experience with my kids was wonderful, but there were a few experiences that um, weren't. And the and some of the concerns that I had occasionally as a parent when my child, one of my children, defended themselves. Um, or didn't defend themselves, I'm hearing that again from parents, and I wanna make sure that, that it's clear what is defense and what isn't. So when we were talking about a particular um, email that I'd received that I'm, I'm sure I've forwarded on to, to you, Dr. Jenkins, and to others, the parent perceived it as self-defense. Um, don't know how that came out, and it's not our place to you know, meddle in how that came out, but if, pushing somebody away or if somebody is choking you and you strike them to to get them to stop choking you do we how do we is that get defined somewhere and does that need to be defined here or I can Look, read to you yeah. on page 16 in the student code of conduct um, what we notate about self-defense um, self-defense is described as an action taken to restrain or block um, an attack by another person or to shield oneself from being hit by another person. Retaliating by hitting a person back is not self-defense and would be considered as fighting. Okay, so, so clearly I see the difference between retaliating where somebody punched you, they're not punching you right now, you respond and the, the fight continues versus somebody is choking you and you're pushing them and that's not working and if somebody's choking you, you you're gonna kick, it, you're gonna push, you're gonna do whatever, and I, as a mom, I want my child to do whatever they need to do if they're being choked to survive. So in that situation, we would interpret that differently. Okay, thank you. Um, next up, we have Member Gordon. Well, thank you. I love what I'm hearing here. Um, as a well, mom <laughs> as, as, as the chair. That is right. really wonderful, all right. So. Um, Okay, you stated that the next step is to work with the board members and the employees and the community. Question number one, when do you plan to go into the different communities and how did you plan to present it? Are you going into each district, which is a lot, are you gonna open up a meeting to the public here um, for input because hearing um, Chair Jacobs see, as a mother, that's very important and we know what comes before our board. Um, is there any reason why what the chairman uh, stated that the petty acts, I know that we have them in the uh, school justice policy partnership agreement, but is there any way that we could put in parentheses and put them in the code? Because what you have for us to look at, on, we ask you to put it in board docs, when we wanna hit it, when we're sitting up here, we go right there. 
or you could go ahead and put in the justice policy agreement, but that's going to give us two different documents that we have to be dealing with at the board table. So if you put what she is asking, uh, the petty acts in parentheses, just not all, it could be as is example, that would help us to clarify it a little bit more in the code of student conduct. You don't have to lay it out. You, you know, when we get there, you can say, see, have a link and make it a hot link when you say C, and it takes us right into that policy. So if you could do, I love what she is saying there. Um, the uh, self-defense is another thing, like she stated, is not defined. That's when we get parents fighting for their kids. Their mama and them daddy, they're going to come in here and they're going to fight for their children. Those children may not have never hit anybody, but we, several of us, have sat on this board, and because they fought back, they had to go. Well, that was pretty much under zero tolerance. But now with the restorative justice and the hearings and, you know, and the appeals, it's a little different. But I still do believe that what the chair is saying is very important because parents have concerns and we need to spell it out for them um, that once they do it, because most of the kids pretty much got it in their heads. We don't get a lot like we used to before. So being, you know, thank you for reading it on page 16, but I think it's very important that some kind of way that self-defense is, is a little bit more, because she asked. And if, and if a parent has to ask and the chairman has to ask, you know, the kids be asking, but go and I defended myself and now my child, is, you know, my child was defending himself and now he's expelled, okay? Um, I think, I think that's it. I am concerned about the suggested revisions that I gave you. So are you going to bring it? Because this is our work session. So I thought you were going to bring some of those to the work session that Mr. Boyard, did I get his name right? Mm -hmm. OK, you can tell him I asked about him. I'm blasting him. <laughs> OK, and tell him not to be afraid. I love him with all my heart. I know he had to go get his child that day. And that's number one. Always remember, your family is number one. If anybody got to walk away from this table, you get out of here. Your children are number one. You can call in. You can see the superintendent and get this information. Or you can get staff. Always remember, your children are number one. I've seen a lot of divorce and separations up here. All right? Yeah. Okay. Take care of your family. Thank you. All right. Okay. I believe that's it. Uh, you've done a great job in bringing a very simplified report to us um, in, in such a short manner. And I want to thank again Dr. Jenkins and her leadership and her wonderful staff. And I do recognize all of you, even when you worked at Oak Ridge. So I do apologize that day. I couldn't get everybody's name. Join us in Delilah. And I, I am so sorry, but Lynn said, Charlie's the only one I remember, and he wasn't even in the meeting that day. <laughs> so that's what confused me. All right, thank you. Excellent. I did it thank again. You. I got a whole minute left. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on a roll up here today. <laughs> the chairman must have scared me in the last meeting, so <laughs> I and I know you're keeping track. I'm she's keeping got a track. she's I'm got a home. minute and one second. That's right. I'm and home. at the next meeting if she needs it. I got no I'm <laughs> <laughs> Okay, next up, member Thank Gold. <laughs> Madam Chair. Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, so so for the sake of board members, they, um, staff did have a summary of the input that they were going to share, but it, it's, it's not not necessary to share, but I just want you to know they do have that as well. You want to hear them today or you want to? Yeah. Okay. Okay. You want to do that? Well, we have, hang on, we have member Gould and member Gallo. Would, yeah, then we are you all right? We hear this first and then? Okay. Member Gallo, yo, you want to speak now? Okay. All right. Go ahead. All right, that's nice. Yeah. Ready? Okay. Please. We are scheduled for a rural development workshop to discuss revisions to policy JIC and the Code of Student Conduct on Tuesday, June 4th. To date, we have received completed questionnaires from OCPS principals and have held two community, me community meetings to get input regarding proposed changes to the code. In addition, we have met with individual school board members to review the current code and have received additional input from individual board members. The suggestions from individual members of the board include address vaping or CBD oil with reference on the acknowledgement page of the code, separate middle school code from high school code, 
revise safe harbor and make more understandable for students, address the FERPA section of the code and highlight information better, revise the dress code policy, add parent signature to the acknowledgement page of code, review and revise bullying in code, ensure clear guidelines are established between different levels, review and revise sexual harassment in code, ensure clear guidelines are established between different levels. Revocation of laptops for serious misuse. Include language regarding medical marijuana. Revise level three response, warning of referral to level four by removing the word warning. Revise DTM hearing procedures and make parents aware that they may bring additional support or representation to the hearing. Revise school board meeting procedures to ensure they are clear and parents completely understand the process before appearing before the board. Add more information pertaining to restorative justice. Highlight that speak out outline and review self-defense. The suggestions from community, school, and staff input duplicate some of the board's recommendations and adds. Add out-of-county expulsion language from policy JC to JIC. Reformat, reorganize code to make more user-friendly. Add language that all threats are taken seriously, even those alleged to be made in a joking manner. Change 4Y physical attack definition to include students. Modify 4O sexual harassment and 4P sexual offense to be clear that one is consensual and the other is non-consensual. Add language to the free speech section that speech can be restricted if it causes a campus disruption or harms the safety, health, or welfare of students. Add horseplay to the code. Separate robbery from extortion as they are not always the same offense. Add language about agreement with Valencia Community College and requirement to report serious code violations. Add language that explains safety plans, no contact contracts, and behavior contracts and consequences if one of the foregoing is violated. Explanation of out of school suspensions and location that offer services for students to attend during their time of suspension. Under sexual harassment, include language that states any student who sends, shares, or shows pictures or video will be subject to discipline. Include social media under threats. Create a clear distinction between level three and four threats. And add level three sexual harassment for elementary infractions. Wow. That's pretty. That's pretty impressive. Yeah. All right, Member Gould. Thank you. Every every time you have to review this and the level the level of detail that you go into is really appreciated, and and so are the briefings. Um, I'm. I want to talk about some things that are included in the policy that you've covered I have no issue with, but there's also things that I mentioned in our briefing that I would like to take this um, opportunity just to kind of bring to the board. I, I, I have periodic meetings just out in the community, just very casual, you know, sit down, have a cup of coffee kind of meetings with tends to be lately large groups of people showing up. Um, <laughs> And some of them are teachers, and there has been sadness from those teachers about some of the discipline issues that they're having to deal with. And it's not about dealing with discipline, but it's about the repeat offenders and um, feeling like they have nowhere to kind of go even after a suspension or they've been pulled out to pass kind of thing is happening. They, they feel like all the tools have been used up and now they have to deal with the circumstance in the classroom. And I, I don't know what the answer is, but I sure would like to look at options if there are any. I, I also, and I don't know this to be fact, so I'm gonna say something that may not be true at all, but I feel like we haven't really gone all in on restorative justice in the way that I've seen it in some other models, and I may just not be aware. So I'd like to look at that. And then what does happen, here's where there's a question, it's probably more for the superintendent. 
Um, what does happen when somebody has been taken out of the classroom, and, and maybe it's for minor violations, but multiples, so they've gone to pass, they've come back, they've gone to pass, they've come back. I hear that even kids are trying to get tardy so that they can go to pass and get out of class. Um, but when they've done that and it's disruptive, what, what can the teacher do and what resource might be available for them for intervention with that child so it's not distracting for the whole class? Okay. Um, Dr. Jenkins. I don't want to put you on the spot. No, I know. I don't mind responding. So if you recall from our um, survey information, the next time we talk about our strategic planning, it's certainly an area that we need to emphasize because two things are clear from uh, surveys in general. First of all, there was indication that they support our overall discipline policies. Secondly, they weren't as convinced that some of our efforts to keep children in school were being affected. There was a split on that question. But here is a very telling answer that was given. They do not believe that they're seeing a difference in children when they come back from suspension, which is some indication, um, uh, there's a split on it, but there's some indication that what we already know, suspension does not necessarily improve behavior. And so we've got to be more diligent, not just around restorative justice, but around other options, other efforts we might make that will change behavior. If we're in the business of educating students, our discipline is to change behavior, not just to make them serve a sentence or serve punishment, but there are adequate uh, consequences that students have to serve when they make poor decisions. But teachers are in large numbers, at least, are saying to us, when they come back after suspension, we don't see an improved behavior. So we've got that. I think that's an area that we can have significant uh, focus around appropriate um, restorative justice, um, uh, trauma-informed schools, um, uh, culturally responsive classrooms, things that can hopefully engage students and try to keep them in the learning process rather than sending them home because they don't come back fixed. Uh, at the same time, I don't want teachers to be uh, um, frustrated. And when you hit a certain level and you've had enough interventions, you're going home. But I think we have to acknowledge when they come back, they're usually not fixed just because we sent them home. So we've got to have uh, more aggressive, more um, data-proven strategies that help change behavior. Because at the end of the year, when we hit uh, the season, that teacher is still held accountable for outcomes of a student, whether they've been in the classroom or suspended off and on that entire year. It's to the teacher and everyone's benefit that we have an opportunity to educate that child. And it certainly will make a difference in their future and in this community's future as well. So suspension alone is not a solution. And clearly that's shown in our teacher responses as well. Don't have all the answers. I think it's an effort and area that we'll have to continue to focus on. And Ms. Gould, I acknowledge while we started restorative justice in the middle schools, I can't tell you that it has reached critical mass uh, for our middle schools as we've started it in our high schools. Time will tell whether or not it's having an impact, but uh, we've certainly not done all that we can around restorative justice. Go ahead. Um, thank you for that. I, I, you know, I'm going to bring back something um, that I talked about when I went to Japan and, and how kids are really peer accountable, and that's what I liked about restorative justice. But do we have the ability as a board to um, assign community service and um, and even if the community service is on the campus of cleaning and picking up garbage and I mean those kinds of things, or if they really need more sensitivity and empathy, that we work with some of our community partners where they go you know, to the food bank and pack boxes or something like that because I think the tone that we see in the media and the social media right now is making it even harder than it has ever been. And that's not reality in our community. There are many kind and wonderful, caring people that step up every single day. Um, and I'm not sure that reaches our teenagers on a regular basis. And that's, that doesn't matter if they're ill-behaved or not ill-behaved. They just live in such a structured environment 
they don't see what we see in this community. Madam Chair, I am absolutely interested in being able to assign um, positive community service for young people. I think that would certainly have a greater impact than having them go and stay at home and supervised. Uh, even in our suspension centers where we have them uh, still accountable for some of their schoolwork, I'm not convinced that enough are taking advantage of that. So I'm very interested in requiring some kind of positive community service. I will tell you there, there will probably be some pushback around um, work detail. <laughs> cleaning up around campus. Uh, there will probably be some pushback around that. That was discontinued um, years ago, uh, especially because in some instances it looked like the same children um, and children who uh, looked a certain way of, a, of certain ethnicities doing those work details. And so um, I think it's an opportunity for us to look at some positive ways to impact students with community service rather than just pure suspensions. I'd love to have uh, more research and discussion around that. All right, next we have um, Member Gala. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, before I get started, I want to piggyback on the conversation that we're having that um, Member Gould brought up, um, and I appreciate Dr. Jenkins' uh, uh, comments on it as well, and we've been having these conversations about mental health and social emotional learning, so when we talk about trauma-informed care and restorative justice, we have to incorporate that social emotional learning piece. I think that the, the children that are acting up, I agree that suspensions don't work. Um, the restorative justice program that we have, I'd love to get more information on that and see some of the data surrounding where we've been. I know it's been a short time that it's been implemented, but it's kind of really gotten a bad rap um, within our community amongst some parents, especially in some schools that have struggled in those discipline areas. And I think part of the reasons is that we kind of put it in too quickly, too fastly. And maybe if we would have rolled it in school by school, picked out a couple of pilots, and done it that way, and kind of tweaked it and learned from our mistakes, and then move forward, we might have had a greater success um, from what I'm talking to people and what I'm hearing. But I still fall back to the social emotional learning and the need to incorporate in, that our, in our curriculum. So I just wanted to throw that on there, because we, we did bring that up. Um, I would like to thank staff. You guys are phenomenal because you've met with all of us and we all had different things. And I know I personally went off on a tangent on the dress code. And, and, you, and you were so gracious with me and you wanted me to explain. And I think my comment was really, do you really want me to go over that again? <laughs> um, but I did, I did want to point that out. When we look at the dress code, I, I want schools to have autonomy. I want principals to be able to run their schools the best way that they do see fit. I do have an issue when a, a principal or someone in the community, a principal, would decides to make it more stringent than what the school board up here has approved. I do believe that there should be something in the dress code that when we as a school board and as a collective body say this is what should be in in the code of conduct, that that's what should be in the code of conduct, that's what should be followed. I don't think it should be more stringent. I don't think that they should have the latitude to up in a policy that we've created. So if we could tweak that and maybe put something along those lines. Um, what else? Um, the community meetings, I was just curious when those took place and what was the forum for those and how we got the information out that we were having community meetings regarding the code of conduct. Good afternoon. Those meetings took place on February 13th and February 27th uh, here at the ELC. March, I'm sorry, March, 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 March 13th and March 27th. Yes, right here at the ELC and uh, the room right behind us. So the community is invited, everyone's invited, the schools are invited. The attendance is it was rather low, but uh, we had some in very good information from the families that did, did attend this year. And how do we disseminate the information? information. How, do we, how do we let the community know we are having these meetings? The information is forwarded through the schools, uh, through okay. the principals of the schools. They should put it on their uh, marquees and throughout home letters or whatever, but that's how it's usually done. Wonderful. Thank you. Welcome. Um, and then just real quickly to go over a, a few other things. Um, I agree about the self-defense that we need it clearly defined. Because um, I don't know if I heard pushing, but sometimes, 
you, my daughter got into an altercation and she was literally pushing the person off of her and she was suspended and and I, I, looking back on it, and if she's listening to me, she'll be mad at me, but I, she had made me mad, and so I probably didn't properly defend her like I should because I felt like she should have reported. Anyways, um, <laughs> it's my own problem. Um, the other thing is I'd like to see a policy, and maybe it's, it's clearly defined, and I missed it, on the laptops and laptops usage because I have gotten complaints from parents on when they do not want their child to use a laptop. They've been met with resistance, even though I think in the policy it clearly states that it's an option for parents and they're basically being told you can't conduct your thank you <laughs> you can't conduct your you it's very hard for for them to be taught without the laptop so if we could have some something in our policy that would help help parents understand the basis behind that or, or, or just make it more clearly defined on what their options are if they do not wish their child to have a laptop that's all I have thank you all right, before we, before we move on, if we can just hold for one minute, because um, I want to make sure that as these um, the conversations go into the record, uh, I wanted to turn to Dr. Jenkins for clarification about how restorative justice was implemented. Certainly. Uh, Dr. Lawson and his team should have been doing one-on-ones with uh, new board members, older, I'm sorry, <laughs> previous <Whoa>. previous <laughs> previous board members would be aware of it but it was not rolled out to everyone at once it was done in a small group and then expanded in our middle schools and then we delayed an additional year before we started rolling it out in our high schools um, and we have um, data there was actually a work session we'll certainly make sure if Dr. Lawson hasn't seen you he can give you the data behind it as well but it was rolled out um, systematically as uh, as, as was planned. Okay. Um, wait, did you have any? I can try to remember. Were there, was there a question? Was there? Were there? Do you need a response from anybody? No. Okay. Good. Okay. Very good. All right. Next, Ma uh, Madam Chair. I'm sorry. Please. Absolutely. And so I would probably also recommend the issue around laptops. Probably doesn't belong in the code, but we can make sure that feedback is for that particular policy as well. Next, we have Member Gordon. Okay, thank you so much. I, I'm going to piggyback on Member Gallo. We, we sent you the chocolate. We understand the hurt. <laughs> I got chocolate, too, on my hurt. <laughs> we understand. I don't want to ask you, basically, you know, your daughter's, I saw your daughter. She's beautiful. Probably happened when she was first grade, right? I'm just kidding. <laughs> but the pain is still there. Okay, I just, I just love this, because we do get affected up here with our children. Uh, because they're all CPS kids, and we love that. Okay, in fairness of the parents, of the staff, students, and parents, thank you, Member Gallo, um, and, and thank you, Member Gould, for the information, and even the chairman for just uh, coming back and helping us to clarify everything. Um, I, th I don't think you're the only one. I think all of us had a little bit to add on the dress code, but I think Member Gould and I, and I know she must have said something because we were in that national meeting up in Philadelphia when the, the choir came on stage. And uh, we did this in past with Dr. Jenkins um, under, our, uh, under Mr. Block, and he doesn't mind me saying it. We, we had, you know, we got money, but we didn't get money like for our district to use for, you know, choir, band, football cliques, um, dance uniform. We wanted our kids to look good. So Dr. Jenkins, she put together a fund and allow us to use it in any manner that we want. The chair used his, you know, for colleges, and then he saw that was very expensive. And then he said, well, y'all can take some of my money and use it. My kids needed performing art things. They needed academic things. So basically, most of mine, that's where it goes. Joey Cadle decided to give hers and um, increments and just divide up the whole thing and give everybody a little bit of it. But um, my other schools didn't complain. If they wanted something, it was those who asked, those who communicated, and those who had a need. And then those that couldn't, we as school board members saw to it that your school had business partners like the Rosens, I'm just saying, you know, like the Junior Achievement, and you know, and and uh, like Disney Universal, they will they will help you with things if you ask, and 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 provide even more. Well, 
I mean, Ms. Jacobs, no. Even Community Action Board. We got a lot of stuff done, not only just for the students, but for the parents that needed things done. But so I'm, I'm saying all of that in defense of how important it is, and you all really covered everything in that. And to think this is only policy JC. <laughs> this is not the whole Code of Student Conduct. It's one policy. So y'all got a long way to go up here with the policies. But I do want to add that Board Member Gould could attest to, we have seen so many performance at the national level. The most embarrassing one was this year. There were girls with everything out. I just thought when they danced, it was going to pop out. I'm being honest. I'm being honest. There were barely buttons. There was no, and they were not poor children. They were, they were being themselves. What you were talking about down there, um, remember Gallo it, with the dress and how they want to just come in and, and the teacher let them. And I mean, they were just so embarrassing. One girl had on a garter and then every time she flipped around, the garter went up and it, it was, the, if you all see, well, you know, I'm not gonna send you to see it, but you probably will. It was the most embarrassing. So. I, I didn't add on my part, and some of the other members may have, but I feel that when you go off and represent the school district, we don't have that in our policy, that they need to be dressed presentably. Okay, you know, and, and um, that was not in there. If they're representing OCPS, if they are not, they cannot use our names. They cannot even wear our shirts, okay? My principal tell us, don't y'all go over there and then wear my shirt and everybody know you from this school. Don't do that. But if they're representing us on a national level, we must know what our children are wearing before they get on that bus or on that plane. So I, I forgot to say that national meetings, even district festivals, everybody should be dressed accordingly. And I think, um, remember, Lopez might have said it, but down on this, and somebody was talking about uh, the addition to it, and I know I, I, I dwelled on that, but it dawned on me when I saw those girls on that stage, everybody around me was talking about their, what they had on, so they couldn't enjoy the performance, even though the performance was good, but it was uh, very embarrassing. And everybody had on something different, and it really looks bad, but it was the same color, mm -hmm. but it was their own thing. You know, mm -hmm. naked, this, back out, mm -hmm. arm length. It, it was just very embarrassing. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that's what I just mm -hmm. wanted to add to that. And thank you so much. Okay. Absolutely. Good, good comments. Um, Member Lopez. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the the 10 day suspension um, out of the school is driving me crazy. Um, I think it's a hazard for our students. And I agree with the commun positive community service um, because we don't want the student to, well, I don't want the students to feel, um, to feel, um, I don't wanna, I don't want them to feel that their self-esteem is down or that they are not important or that we, I know they commit uh, you know, they did something that they shouldn't do it. But I believe that the community service should be an, a positive experience. I don't know, I was thinking about lawyers, judge, um, judges. I was thinking about um, police officers to be mentors, to have a, a group to just inspire our students to, to see themselves in the future instead of putting them to pick up trash or to clean the some some place. I'm not saying that that type of job is, is is demeaning because my mom used to clean houses for a living. So I believe this is a very honest job, but I don't think it's an inspiring, positive community service for our students that are having that type of situation because we don't know what is happening in that um, house, in that um, family environment because they just keep going with the same behavior. They are going with the same behavior. Something is happening. Do we have um, any type of mental um, health follow-up with this type of students that is having the same behavior over and over? 
that's the first question. The second question is, um, I think in that this type of suspension can increase our pipeline from school to prison, because I believe that our students of color are more affected in this type of um, situations on suspension. I would love to see more positive um, uh, solutions, not punishments because I think they can change their behavior by feeling inspired by others leaders from our community. Thank you. Remember, uh, Ashley, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm sorry, I'm trying to determine, there was a question about yes. mental health yes. in there. Can, would somebody like to answer that question? So the mental health services is a separate department from um, discipline, but as far as um, discipline goes for our level fours, we do have counseling programs for first time offenders. So we would have um, back on track is for drug drugs use, alcohol. drugs and alcohol. Um, we have stop and think and think about it. And those are for um, sexual acts. Um, we have theft talk for mm -hmm. theft. Um, we also have cyber talk, which is for uh, electronic device violations. Mm -hmm. So we do offer some counseling programs for first time offenders um, to go through to provide that, that kind of feedback and then we do progressive discipline from there. Um, but as far as the mental health piece, that's a different um, department. But it's only for the first time offenders? Yes, okay. currently. So if the student keep going with the same behavior, what are we gonna do with them? Absolutely, Dr. Jenkins, you recognize. So while these won't have that expertise for the code of conduct, I want to reassure you, at a school level, counselors, um, psychologists, school psychologists, teachers, and others, when they see a troubled child that has issues going on, it, it doesn't have to be tied to the code of conduct. They can have a child study team. They can certainly refer for counseling because they see that student is troubled. Doesn't mean that they've actually had a, a breach in the code of conduct. Any behavior that's out of the norm then we're asking them to be referred and go through um, that referral process to try to get them the appropriate mental health assistance they need. So I, if the, the, the bullying and the, the victim, both of them, they can have um, any type of follow-up because I think even the bully and the victim are facing cer certain situations mm -hmm. that are gonna be you know, emotionally affected. So at, at a certain level, at the very beginning levels where there is a problem with the relationship restorative justice can kick in a counselor sits down and talks about what's gone wrong with the relationship and makes them actually try to face each other but if you're in a serious bullying incident there's another policy that uh, the code kicks in and and uh, there won't be a whole lot of options what we try to do in restorative justice is deal with relationship issues at the onset before there's an all-out brawl, before there's significant bullying, because then we have to kick into high gear uh, once the, there's actual bullying going on. So think of restorative justice trying to make relationship repaired uh, instead. If it moves to the next level, then the consequences elevate. Thank you. Member Castellano. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I. I understand we're going over discipline and the code of conduct, but um, it seems to me like there is such an intersection of the behavior, discipline, and mental health um, that we almost can't look at them in isolation. Um, behaviors have many different causes um, and then treatments and they do intersect and it's hard to tease them apart. Um, I know that in, um, in the schools, um, I would like to see a, a priority in a comprehensive guidance program where the guidance counselors aren't necessarily doing lunch duty because that's a lot of times how they're used and I understand that we are stretched for personnel to be in there monitoring students and it's a safety issue and and then sometimes that's justified by saying well that's how the guidance counselor gets to know the students and there are other I, I would think more effective uses for that expertise uh, for guidance counselors and I would like to recommend that because I've that's what I've seen in almost every school I've I've been in is how they're used um, and then we're not really taking advantage of that uh, their expertise. Also, um, 
Um, I know, let's see, M Member Gould was talking about repeated misbehaviors, and those sometimes are the most troubling for teachers because they're low level and they recur, and um, we don't have a lot of tools for those students. Um, and what, um, what might be an idea uh, for a response might be uh, for teachers to have access to behavioral specialists and not just when a child is so severe that someone from the district comes into the school and then does like a study on the child. Um, sometimes there are extremes and that has to happen, but uh, there are so many teachers who struggle with the particulars in their classroom. Um, certain personalities of students and, a, and, a inner, and the dynamics of students that if they had access to um, a behavioral specialist who could be more accessible to just the general teachers, I think that would be um, helpful in preventing some of these misbehaviors and giving teachers some relief and some extra help. Um, also, other ways to kind of prevent and change behavior, um, I would um, just kind of reiterate what Member Gallo mentioned is in the social emotional curriculum so that we are building kids and their relationships and, the, and um, their self-esteem up. Um, and that's in, when you look at the minutes that we allot for the different subjects, we don't have minutes allotted for social emotional curriculum. So you sometimes have to justify, I'm going to teach um, being kind today and I'm gonna have to carve it out of my reading time. And it's really hard to do, but I think that that is worthwhile, and I think we should allow teachers that freedom to know that that is okay, um, and that we make that a priority. And we can, it is um, English language arts. It is still, um, it still counts, and I think we need to let teachers know it's not just, just the standards, but we have a bigger mission here, and I think the dividends will pay off in the long run. Also, the matrix for the level four discipline that we use, um, I, those are, I just can't believe the number of kids who repeat, or, you know, the, the vaping and all those um, <laughs> uh, different behaviors. But I noticed that they, when you said they have a level four counseling, I wonder if there's something that we could also do for elementary uh, when it's not level four, when we do have these repeat students, if we could, instead of um, scrambling um, or just knocking our heads against the wall, what do we do next? If that could be another tool that we provide some other intensive counseling, maybe with a family as well. I know you can't mandate that, but, uh, and then finally, if I may, go continue. Um, the, uh, another area that is um, teachers find kind of in this gray area is in um, repeated student misbehavior where the school has a referral form, a school level discipline form, which they use to then, you know, notify the principal or assistant principal that there is an issue with a student and they get a consequence, but it's not a referral. And you go through that process, which I understand you want to kind of solve this problem before it reaches the point of an actual referral on their record and where you have to document the consequences and the misbehavior. But there doesn't seem to be any structure for how many of those discipline forms can you use until you finally use that referral. And I know in a discipline meeting, um, Ms. Joyner did say, well, you have every right to use a referral, every teacher. But at, it, realistically, in the classroom or at the school level, it's, um, you're, it's kind of 
the teachers are put in an awkward position for doing that. So it is, um, there's no structure for how many of those school level forms you can use. And sometimes there might be tw 20 times for one student. And it, it doesn't seem to help. So if there's some kind of structure in place or recommendation about how to use this code of conduct and the forms we use, because that's, that's a, a, a problem. It's even hard to explain. So those are just my concerns with implementing the code of conduct. Thank you. OK. That was a lot to absorb. Um, I, I actually was going to speak to a different issue, but I want to I, I want to I wanna speak to the last comment you made first about um, because I was not aware of this pre-referral form that doesn't count as a referral, and I think I did share with the group I think I did about a concern that that I have with um, it's going to seem unrelated but law enforcement where law enforcement has an opportunity in some jurisdictions to look the other way when they see um, certain illegal, like open an open bottle or marijuana in the car. Um, and depending upon whether the, the person in that car has a respectful, good attitude, then they just get a verbal warning and it never gets documented. But if the officer doesn't like the attitude that they got from that individual, then they, um, they may be taking them to jail. Or certainly um, issuing some, you know, some sort of um, a, a ticket or something, whatever the case may be, depending upon. And then it's only for, you know, small amounts of marijuana and, and low-level things. But I've always had a little bit of concern that, given putting that discretion in the hands of law enforcement officers, there may be things other than the person's attitude that may dictate um, who is going to jail and who's not going to jail. And that bias is is hidden, and um, there's no record whatsoever, and that concerns me. As we talk about social justice, as to whether or not we even have any idea how much injustice there might be. So when you mentioned what you did, I I could picture the same thing happening. That if there isn't documentation, that you you could have situations where certain students are showing up as a referral and other students are doing the equally the same things multiple times and aren't. And there are certainly a, a legitimate concern about whether there's a discrimination factor taking place. So I think that needs a separate conversation um, to better understand than we're gonna get to here, Dr. Jenkins. Certainly. Um so not familiar with the pre-referral form. If Ms. Castro-Dental gives me more detail, I'm happy to look into that. Our referral form is online, and we've said even to Wendy, to our union, any teacher who wants to write up a referral should use the one online. This is the first time I've heard of a pre-referral form. I am happy to look into that, but that is not something that's been authorized. Happy to look into that. I also think, uh, to your comment, uh, Madam Chair, it is critical that we have consistency. Part of the School Justice Partnership actually delineates the use of civil citations and it lists specifically those that are el those uh, offenses that are eligible for civil citations and it was for the main purpose of causing consistency among our law enforcement agencies and so i believe all except maybe one I should say all, I believe all of our law enforcement agencies signed on to um, the School Justice Partnership, but it was to, to provide consistency. So no matter what part of the county you live in, if you did one of these, which is a, a low level misdemeanor, you should be getting a civil citation rather than being handcuffed and taken to jail. All of that, um, uh, uh, our Chief Judge Lawton was involved in that, as well as our law enforcement leads from all over Orange County. Um, and our uh, Orange County um, officers as well, so we could get some consistency around civil citation, because you're absolutely right. Depending on where you were when the offense happened, you could go to jail, and someone else gets a slap on the wrist or a civil citation. So hopefully that school justice partnership has uh, done away uh, with some of those inconsistencies. We are certainly monitoring it. Thank but, you. but thank you for bringing that up. Uh, there was one other item around mental health. I wanted to mention um, 
So we do have team, we have behavioral teams that work through the school around mental health issues. Uh, usually it's through the guidance counselor, but um, Chair, you had mentioned this before, and I know we, we won't be getting to budget discussions because we don't know what we're getting yet, but it was one of the issues that you brought up before, if there's any possible way to try to lower those ratios, because if we're depending on counselors to be the lever to help get some of those services in place, uh, and I know mental health has been uh, your mantra since, uh, you've come here. I think we can, depending on the money, I think we can probably try to make additional efforts around lowering those ratios. I'm, I'm very hopeful for that. If we depend on them to be the lever for even engaging, mental health counselors are not assigned to every school. We don't have the money. What was given to us is not enough for that, <laughs> clearly. Um, uh, but that counselor is really our first defense for, for children and the issues that they're going through. So I, I want you to know that we have the connections, but they're stretched. All right, the, what I had intended to speak to was the issue of um, what, what are effective tools to, or consequences that, I, that um, Dr. Jenkins is looking at, what options besides suspension. And it's not surprising, I don't think, to any of us that if you have a child who is um, in trouble, there's a good chance they're also behind academically. And not having to go to school, I always thought, looked like a reward to me. Um, so it needs to be effective, but I think we would all agree that it also is extremely important that that child that uh, that discipline in the classroom needs to be re maintained for the rest of the school. So, as we've been talking about different options, I would I would love to think that there are there's a model out there um, that has been. Um, proven to be effective that we can look at rather than trying to create something um, from thin cloth. And I don't know if that's the right terminology or not. But anyway, um, I'd love to understand what other school districts have done that works better while maintaining order in the classroom. And then, because um, I, I completely agree with the direction that the previous board has gone in, in terms of trying to limit expulsions and suspensions. We want our kids to succeed. And that's not a route to success. At the same time, though, I also recognize that some of the ideas that we have um, I, I'm always I'm, I'm going to always play devil's advocate. It's just uh, the nature of who I am. But I've always thought it would be good for our children real, at real early age, as I, I challenged um, my, my first principal, to um, not give our kids little trinkets when they did um, fundraisers. I wanted our ki my children to understand that if we're raising money for children with heart disease, that the reason we do it is because we want to help these kids, not because they're going to get a little plastic toy. And so with that in mind, I get a little concerned when we talk about community service and whether or not our kids are going to say, I got in trouble and now I have to do community service. This is discipline. Discipline equals I did something wrong. It's a punishment. And I really think we want them to see community service for the values. So I would. I just want us to slow think that, but I also think that we also need to make sure that other children in the classroom, no matter what it is, if it's going into a mentorship program, that our kids, other kids in the classroom, don't perceive that's a reward. So it's really, really tricky, yeah. and um, I don't think any of us are going to figure that out sitting here at the dais. But I think that we're all in agreement that we need to figure it out is where we need to be, and to trust the superintendent and her team and the great city schools and all of those other resources to figure out the best step forward. And I did it in five minutes, yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Member Cobert. everybody that that is good. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, uh, I really appreciate and value this conversation, the discourse that we're having up here um, as we assess the code, uh, because these are the things that we're hearing from our community. And you know, I, I heard on a national radio program this morning that because the anniversary of Columbine is coming up and we're, school districts across the nation are having these conversations and about the fact that we no longer, schools are no longer around just to educate. We provide so many more social services, emotional, mental health services, and that that really has been a, become a vital part of what we do. And we need to acknowledge that. As difficult as that is and as limited a, as our resources are, that has become a part of our mission. Um, on the social and emotional learning piece, I, I couldn't agree more with that because as we struggle with 
the increase in mental health issues, I think the social and emotional piece is the preventative part because our mental health services are mostly reactive and we should look at being proactive and how do we prevent? Again, it, it has become a part of our mission and I think that's a very important piece. I also agree with the conversation on self-defense. My son had the, the, the same issue coming home going, I'm being physically assaulted, but if I, if I, have, if I act in self-defense, am I the one who's gonna get in trouble? So that's an, a very important piece that we need to look at at clarification. And then, Member Gallo, you said something about the, um, the dress code and, have, and the, the district dress code and the individual schools being able to add to that. I think that's primarily so that individuals, communities can make those decisions about, uh, for example, being in uniforms. So that's where I think it's important that we do leave it up to each individual community to decide if that's something they want. I have a number of schools that are in uniform. They absolutely love it and would not want that taken away, but I definitely think it's up to each individual community, not for the district to impose that, but to also allow that if that's something that that community um, sees fit. So that I think is probably why that's in the policy, just to allow for that flexibility. So, thank you. You're welcome. Oh, <laughs> the chocolate <laughs> fairy today. Oh, <laughs> member Gallo, again. <laughs> That's for Colbert. Oh, yeah. Hello, you gave, I gave that to She gave it to me. I got it. <laughs> right. Sorry. You can have it because I had my share. But it's half empty. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you. you had to share that, didn't you? Did Could have kept that like secret to yourself. That's my favorite. Oh, wonderful. Thanks to Gallo. Mine was middle school, just for the record. <laughs> Yours? Middle school? Yeah. High school. Okay. Middle school. High school. Okay. All right. Member Gordon, you're up. Madam Chair, thank you so very much. I, I love everything I'm hearing tonight. Um, I, I think that I, I really love what I'm hearing, but I love the way Dr. Jenkins' team has really put everything together. I heard either in the final report, I was looking it up here, but what board member Caster Dental was talking about, there is a spot there, and it might have been given on the revisions and the recommendation, and I was trying to find it. Um, I don't know, it, it was either in your final report that you gave us on the suggested revisions when you hit them, but I know it looked like it was in the level four, um, uh, under the offenses response, but I know on one in the summary, um, under level four offenses response code, where it says include responses such as the parental contract, the suspension, but it ought to be that's where the teacher, um, you know, she's talking about the protection of the, like, well, it could be here, hearing um, several of the members up here tonight, especially member, member uh, this is so funny, because you guys, uh, we all have done what you're doing, talk about our children. Mm -hmm. I think all of us have done that. Some of our kids have been uh, suspended. Thank God I don't think any have been expelled. But um, in fairness and defense of staff, students, parents, that, that really, and teacher. Well, staff includes teacher, faculty and staff, we could say. But it was somewhere in level four when you gave your report, it, it includes a response, and Dr. Jenkins, added on to um, board member Mer um, member casting dental uh, in reference to where it could go, but it was somewhere that you all brought it up that it can include the responses from it. She said she had never heard of the pre, what was it, Dr. Jenkins? Right, the pre-referral, but you, there was somewhere in here, I don't know how I lost it, because I made a note and I said, oh my God, that, that is a great place for it to fit. You know, because um, you do have include the responses from the parent, but it could be the student, since they're the ones that need to really put that contract together. Because you were thinking of the most serious level, which is the level four, or were you thinking of all of the levels? What? Okay, but there, you, you gave it in the very end of it. I think Delilah might have brought that up. 
but somebody brought it up and it, it's a great place. But when you go back and Dr. Jenkins, have you all to go back, you have a lot to digest tonight. Um, of what we gave you. So I don't know how you're going to fit it in, but I'm sure you're going to bring it back that we will be able in that development um, workshop. Thank you so very much. But there is a place that that can fit because the children, that child, they have a right, and then that parent, they have a right, even though you do have the parent contact through it, but the parent ought to have a little part that they can have that in there some kind of way. And it's just a, a courtesy. And it's just to let them hear their voice. You found it? I, you want to read it? Yeah, because you said it in your report. I think this is what um, you're referencing. It says, add language that explains safety plans, no contact contracts, and behavior contracts, and consequences if one of the foregoing is violated. I think that's it. And then she's talking now about hitting every level, the level one, level two, level three, and level four. And that way, everybody, it's a fairness. It's an equity thing. All right, thank you. Very thank good, you, very good. good All right, next, um, Member Bird. You're recognized. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> okay, I'm going to be quick because everybody has already said most of the things that I had down. Um, except, I think, and we, we talked about this a while back to maybe have a look at the first, or no, do we have the review of the... Sorry, the release of directory information, is that on the code of conduct or is that something separate that they sign, isn't it, in the beginning of the year? So we reference it in the code of student conduct, um, but there is actually an electronic form that goes home. Um, I believe it's issued by digital curriculum okay. for the FERPA or the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act release. Okay, because I thought that that was something that we had said earlier in the a few many board meetings ago, that that was something that we wanted to look at and make sure that parents were aware of exactly what they were and signing, because we, I think it wasn't real clear, maybe yeah. the description of. And we were gonna, we're gonna work with digital curriculum too and see what, what they plan on um, using this next year and okay. potentially revising what's in our code to match what they have. Okay. Um, also, a quick question. On level four, we've got 10 day suspension um, and expo or expulsion. And I'm just, can you just clarify for me where um, the line, is there a line? Or is that something that's mm. we kind of up to the, the school and the area superintendent? I mean, how do we decide if it's a 10 day suspension or if it's the expulsion? Level fours carry a 10-day suspension, or some schools, depending on, they may use a combination of in-school or out-of-school, but you get your 10-day suspension. Then you have your discipline team meeting with the area administrator where we look at the, um, the facts. We make sure due process was given to the student. If it meets the criteria, we verify it. If the parent requests a administrative hearing, the next step would be an administrative hearing mm -hmm. where the administrative hearing also officer also reviews the information, makes sure there's enough facts, also looks at due process. If they're not happy with the outcome of the um, administrative hearing officer, then they request a meeting to come to the board. Okay. But I think, um, I think I'm more asking though, we have 10 day suspension or expulsion, so. No, if a level four offense will carry a 10 day suspension. Up to, up to a 10 day suspension. It's not an automatic expulsion because it depends on the offense. You can get counseling. You could be um, go to the um, positive pathways, which is our alternative school, or you could be expelled depending on the offense. Okay, but there are certain there are certain offenses that are automatically expulsions. Yes. Right. Yes. Okay, but it doesn't have those in the student code of conduct, does it? Doesn't have those listed anywhere. Am I right? Not separately. Okay. We give a list of the offenses that qualify for level four. Okay. Um, I think maybe that might be something we need to look at just because um, there's a big difference between 10 days suspension and expulsion from school for a year. So um, I think it might be beneficial for kids and parents to be able to say, 
yikes, you know, this is no joke here. This is a full year um, expulsion as opposed to a 10 day suspension. I mean, that's, that's a big difference in one bracket of offenses um, from their point of view. I mean, for them to not be able to see that. All level fours that you, you can be expelled for. Ones, ones, two, and threes, you can't, but a level four, the ones that listed in student code of conduct are our how, how, how highest um, offense, it does carry an expulsion. You can be. But you can be, but not necessarily. You can just get a, you can just get a 10 day suspension. Um, can, can I help out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I hear what you're saying. Um, and so for us, for those of us that are new, we're, we're pretty sure that you have some clear defined line of what's an automatic expulsion versus a 10-day suspension, but we can't tell that. Yeah, you have a matrix, yeah. and we can't tell that from looking at this. So then the question is, how would we know, and if we are not sure, then how does the child know that if I bring in a rifle with ammunition, I'm out of here, I'm expelled. This is not debatable, it's not 10 days. Where is that document, and should it be more clear in the policy? Thank you, yeah, that's kind of what I meant. On the level four, a 10-day suspension is not the consequence. The consequence for the, for the level four will come after the DTM once it's been verified. But, but it may be much clearer to say certain things you can count on, you're going to be expelled. If you bring a loaded gun, if you bring a weapon on campus, we can certainly make that clear in the code. There are some non-negotiables. Yeah. Okay. If you're selling uh, drugs, if you bring a weapon, uh, we, you, now, now you're, still, you're still entitled to your due process. Yes. I, I, want, I want to be very clear. You're still entitled to your due process, but we may be able to put, we'll consult further with legal, but we may be able to put um, asterisk saying these are not only automatic expulsion, but you're going to be arrested. I mean, we, can, we can certainly clarify that with legal ad, uh, advisement. Okay, and also um, I saw that you, there's early reentry, um, from expulsion to positive pathways. How about early reentry from positive pathways back to the school? Do we do that? Or can we do that? We can look into it. Have not done it though. Okay. I think that that might be um, in speaking to positive pathways. That was something that they had mentioned to me um, that they would think would be very beneficial for them as well to be able to offer that to the children for good behavior <laughs> and for you know I mean really I yeah. mean half a year if they it's a positive they do it at, at my school but we were yeah. just trying to get positive pathway in Dr. yeah <laughs> positive right. pathway back in right yeah we didn't have a positive pathway if you committed anything you were out of here mm -hmm. it was zero tolerance so you gone Dr. Jenkins, do you want to? Respond? Yeah, just just one clarification. I don't want it to not want to make it sound uh, too simple, because what we discovered when we observed um, at Miss Gordon's school is there's usually a panel, almost like a parole board, where they have to come and make their presentation and then convince <coughs> that group that they deserve an early reentry. So I don't want to make it. The board. Yeah, I don't want to make it seem too simple, but we'll ha we're happy to look into that. Okay. Okay. Okay, um, and I just want to kind of piggyback on Ms. Gallo, or member Ms. Gallo, member Gallo's um, response about different schools. Well, it's kind of it's not really related. It's sort of related to that, but how different schools are um, instituting possibly the dress code in different ways. And I think that that really goes to the heart of um, some of these issues that we hear from the the we hear from the community or from our teachers or parents is that it's um, it's not something that in our policies that is not defined, but it's more that, po that it could possibly be that it's just being interpreted differently at different schools because um, some schools you get one story, you get a different story than another school. So I think that um, making sure that we have that consistency like what um, we were talking about earlier is something that we really need to reiterate as far as the, the behavior and the discipline. You know, there's, I agree wholeheartedly with um, Member Castor Dental that this is a huge issue that's brought up in the community from teachers and whatnot. Um, and then my last thing real quick would be, can we just, and I mentioned this to you guys when we met, 
you know, do something maybe better education at the beginning of the year to these kids about the code of conduct? Because right now it's just kind of, you know, you read it, you, you do the presentation online and can we do something more interactive? Can we, mm -hmm. I love the videos that um, superintendent produced this year. I think more of that kind of thing, real interactive. They were great. And I think that they, they need to just be able to see more of holy moly, like there's no joke. If I do this, I'm gonna get this, you know? And cause I'm uh, as well as you, I'm appalled at that matrix sometimes that these kids and the, over and over the same thing, same thing. And it's just like, why can we not, I think we need to be clearer, maybe more education at the beginning of the year that guys, this is no joke. You can't bring this up to school, period, in the story. Like, and maybe even have, um, I don't know, some, some, yeah, guided discussions over it, but have maybe some um, people talk that have been through it. I don't know. Maybe some videos of some kids that have been through it. I don't know, but something to be a way to educate them a little better. Thank you. Absolutely. Member Gallo. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, just so quickly, I just, but the comment on, on making sure things are consistent. I do agree with, with Member Cobert that we need to give flexibility to our principals. I don't want to get, I don't want to make my principals angry at me. Um, my point was just not really around uniforms um, and community consensus, because obviously if there's community consensus, we want to do what's best for that community and that community, every community's different. And so we want to offer them that flexibility. My point was more to, as member, um, Bird pointed out the inconsistencies that we have amongst some of our schools in some of the rules. We just, if we could be a little bit more consistent, that would be fabulous. Um, the next thing I want to ask is probably going to open up a can of worms, but um, bear with me. Um, I've, I received a lot of complaints during, it's testing season. We're all getting mm -hmm. the emails. And I don't think that, that we have anything in our code of contact, and Dr. Jenkins can correct me if this is not the place that it would go, but a policy on um, students that opt out on testing. It is, I know that they get a letter. Okay, it doesn't, okay. But I just, to that point, we need some type of clear-cut policy. I know that they get a letter, but to have something in policy on what to do with the children when their parents have chosen to opt them out, because it is more, in, especially in elementary school, more of a parental choice. And so we just want to make sure that we do no harm to our children when those parents make those choices. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Member Gold. Um, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Dr. Jenkins. Just quickly, apologize. Woody's over here kicking me. So what the board, <laughs> what the board, what Ooh, the board, what stop. the yeah. what the board should not do is put in policy some. Uh, we get, we direct our principals on how to deal with that. What you want to be careful about doing is putting something in policy that goes against state statute around testing and so I, I don't know that you actually want a policy for opting out because that seems to fly in the face of actual state law around testing we do however direct our schools on how they're expected to accommodate those children uh, a little bit nervous about creating policy that flies in the face of state statute Madam Chair, can I? Please I, and that and, and I would never want us to do anything that would violate us as constitutional officers. So I guess my point was just more, um, not policy on opting out, but the policy on what we do with those children if their parents do choose that. That, and, and, may, and Woody, Woody's looking at me, so. You're saying during that period of time. During that where period of time, children? like what, what is our policy that, what, what policy do we have in place and what we do with that child? And is, and maybe there is something in state law that dictates how we have to respond to that child and what we do. I mean, can we move that child from the room? Can we put him in the back and allow them to read a book? Like, what policy do we have in place if that parent makes that choice? I guess that's my question. Dr. Jenkins or Mr. Rodriguez? I, I mean, again, I, we had this conversation before. We have provided direction to the principals because this issue has come up repeatedly and the state statutes are clear about the testing shall go forth and this is what thou shalt do in terms of from the legislature. Um, a parent may think that because they're being objective, conscientious objectors, however you want to describe it, they want to pull their children out. But we certainly 
you know, there is no need or it really would not be beneficial in my humble legal opinion. It would be very hard to defend the district if you all adopt a formal policy that says if you don't want to have your child test, here are some other options for you to do. You can pull them out. You can read or something else. Because then what you're really saying is we don't agree with the law and that's your, you know, you're the board. You're going to do what you need to do. But just understand that's a very strong statement you're sending back to Tallahassee which is very inconsistent with stated policy from the legislature as mandated through statute. So um, we do have direction for our principals. We do explain to them that they're to provide the letter, uh, which, you know, I, I understand that can be revisited, obviously, and we can certainly continue that dialogue. But um, that's the direction we've been going with at this point. So. And in light of that, can I suggest, since it's actually not under the code of conduct, that um, we table this conversation, and if we need to bring this back uh, in a more informed conversation, we could do that at that time. So um, we will hear next from Member Gould. Um, thank I you. you were no, I didn't forget. I didn't forget. <laughs> um, thank you, Chair. I'm going to go back a few minutes though mm -hmm. um, I wanted to just uh, respond to the comment you had on the community service and I totally agree with you on the incentivizing of philanthropy and that's not the right motivation I think um, from what I have seen in my my trip to Japan and in talking with some other school boards across the country and um, just articles I've read and I I was trying to find some, but I can't find them, but I will. And when I do, I'll share them. Um, that the act of community service is a little bit different because if they have been in their bubble of living with each other and doing things with each other all of the time and they go out and serve in an environment that they haven't before because they're dealing with other people and getting exposed to other stories and testimonies, it can actually become an inspiration in their lives. And I don't think, it, I do think you risk others wanting to go out and serve, um, but they don't, if they're wanting to do well in school, they're not gonna wanna get out of school to do that, but they may wanna do that through one of their clubs and things, and we have lots of opportunities that way. So I just wanna, I know there's that the staff will do more research around that and take a look at what best practices are, but I just, I didn't want to let that go because I do absolutely agree with you about the philanthropy piece of it, that we're not really teaching them who we're helping, but when they go out and they touch it and they feel it, it's different. So what I hear you saying is it, it's very important that that experience be well thought out so that you get that desired effect. Right. Um, and the second thing I would like to just ask is, I'm not familiar with your trip to Japan. <laughs> I am thinking you probably gave the board a briefing. It was a long um, time. And um, <laughs> it, it, whether we do that as a sunshine meeting, but I'd like to hear more about it. Yeah. So, um, it yeah, because you brought it up several here. times, and <laughs> I'm always interested. No, and I'm very interested in what are other countries doing. So, I definitely would like to schedule time to get an up, a briefing from you on that. Um, oh, let me go to Member Gordon. I'm up next, but Member Gordon, why don't you no, go that's first? Okay. I'm, no. I'm okay. You sure? Okay. Yes, they, I think you've been covering a lot of it. I think that's okay. Hit it for us. Okay, so um, I had um, two things I, I wanted to circ not circle back on, but um, one thing I'm a little bit unclear on on page one, um, number three, and I just since just to, not an answer, but just. To, Clarification when we move forward. It says any board decision which conflicts with, and this is probably a Mr. Rodriguez um, question also, any board decision which conflicts with provisions in the Code of Student Conduct shall prevail until the Code of Student Conduct is revised and subsequently approved. I'm assuming that's for the sake of consistency, that if we approve a decision that's contradictory, that that becomes the defective, <coughs> defect De facto? What is it? De facto, thank you. What is that for and, and how broad is that and should I worry about it? Since I'm not completely clear what it is, that alone. I, that, yeah. that is, uh, just as you described it, the board makes a decision and the code of conduct says this is the penalty, but the board is the ultimate uh, adjudicator of whatever these decisions may be. 
whether they're student discipline decisions or if you make a policy decision um, through policy change or otherwise that is inconsistent with the board, then that needs to be known that the student code of conduct it does not trump or override. It'd be like saying you make a change in the statutes, you override the Constitution. It doesn't work that way. So the, the higher authority is the board, and then your secondary is the student code of conduct. That's for the lawyer parents in the world <laughs> that may be advocating something for their child and say, but the board, you know, so does that help? A little bit. I was okay. wondering if you were referring to the Supreme Court decision earlier when you talked about the statute can't override the Constitution. No, but, no, uh, no it wasn't. Oh, okay. <laughs> But I wholeheartedly agree with you, and I wish you were on the Supreme Court right now. Um, <laughs> I guess what I'm trying to understand is, does this mean, for example, we had a discipline case before us. If we had overridden the decision on that, would that have effectively become the new student? When it says that when the board's decisions conflict with the provisions, then they shall, I, I think it's the board's decision shall prevail D does that mean that that's what we're going to do with each case going forward? Does that? No, no that's not, not what that's supposed to mean. Not unless the board decides that this is how we want to treat these going forward. Okay. Now, do understand that one decision does not create precedents necessarily, unlike legal precedents in the courtrooms. You don't get to go back and say, I'm citing the case of the 1972 you know, student discipline decision. It doesn't work that way. However, uh, it's very clear that if, you know, in October, y'all make a decision as a board that is an interpretation of how you think the policies should be and how the student code of conduct should be interpreted, Madam Superintendent isn't going to bring you 10 more cases identical to it that would be contravening that prior decision, unless there are specific facts or circumstances by which that one case was decided on. Is that makes sense it makes more sense okay so the last um the last comment i was going to make um dr jenkins when, when we talk about repeat um i, I don't want to use the word offenders because it makes me think about a, a different um, arena but children who repeat offenses um students do you, i'm assuming that that you probably have data on that the data is kept on that and or maybe not i was thinking it might be helpful to understand how often do we have that what types of offenses are there um in trying to look at what types of programs might be more effective if we knew what yeah let us take a look at that. I don't know if it's documented exactly like that, especially when they're lower level behaviors, but we'll certainly take a look at that. That, that could inform mm -hmm. uh, uh, some yeah. of our remedies. Some Thank you. Okay, next um, we have Member Lopez. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to clarify um, the same information as Ms. Goal. I think we think the same way. <laughs> so maybe, um, Community service, we can use different, maybe it was the wrong terminology, but in cases I believe that community service as well, sometimes we have several students that they don't know what community service means, and it's not as a punishment, it's just as an experience, uh, a positive experience, but we can also call it services, we can also call maybe having a mentor, um, maybe a teacher, a doctor, a lawyer, what I, I was saying, because sometimes maybe just by walk with somebody that they just got inspired because they don't have that opportunity. Maybe he's gonna be the first one that is gonna graduate from his family. And given that opportunity, for example, in my campaign, I work with several students, they never have the chance to just knock on doors and, and have that experience. Oh my God, this is very fun, you know? Civic engagement is something that they didn't know anything about that. So, you know, with that experience, they just thinking, now they're thinking about, can I have an internship with this commissioner or can I have an internship? And they're coming from, you know, from a low income community and they're just inspired by having that opportunity um, I think that is not um, only as a service, just make make them believe in themselves, so they they have they can see the potential that they have in in themselves. Sometimes they don't have any compliment during the whole day, and they're just waiting for a teacher to say, you know what, you're awesome, you're great, good morning, a smile. Maybe they don't have that in the house, and sometimes we forget about them. I have a question. Um, it's about um, how can I 
Well, oh, how can can we see if the referral is fair or not? Mm -hmm. How can we see the transparency from a referral? Do we have any type of way to see, for example, do we have a data if the same student is having the same referrals from the same person? Do we have that type of um, follow up? Yes, the, at the school level, and then at the district level. Can we have that? I'm sorry, it's just <laughs> trying Dr. to Jenks. think. <laughs> Dr. Jenks? Thank you, so, so we, we put in extra efforts to try to make sure we're consistent across schools, so you can't send a child home without at least the area office, the area superintendent, mm -hmm. seeing that, so we make sure this school is not suspending and sending home while the same offense is not getting an out-of-school suspension. So we've got a handle on that, as, as much as some people may not be excited about it, we're bringing consistency there because we had inconsistencies. Now at the school level, um, we are depending on the principal to be somewhat monitoring if an individual teacher, for example, is um, suspending more, or no, I'm sorry, teacher don't suspend. If a teacher is writing up offenses uh, on the one hand and another teacher is letting those same offenses go by, then that we, we depend on the principal for some training, some professional development to create consistencies there. It's not monitored at the learning community level. We would depend on the principal on there. The principal. And we would also depend on the principal. If I've, if I've got one, if I'm a teacher uh, under um, Dr. Castor Dental and I am, uh, and you, Observe, and she observes me and notices that I'm letting certain kids get away with the same offenses and the other kid gets whacked mm -hmm. and has a, a, a something written up right away, then that's her responsibility as a principal to deal with me and coach me and try to give me some professional support on being consistent in my discipline. Bottom line is we, we certainly need to make sure our teachers are trained to have classroom management procedures in place um, so that they're able to manage their children and deal with those who are, are misbehaving uh, as well. But we don't have any means of of monitoring for consistency at the classroom level. We monitor for consistency at the school level. Excellent question, though. Thank I'm, you. I'm kind of intrigued by that now. Yes. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lopez. Thank you, Member Lopez. Member Gordon. Okay, Madam Chair, I, I think that you all covered it. I, you probably can close us out. Thank you. I will do that. I. Um, I will close us out on this note. I, I will tell you, as I say so often, there are so many things that are done in Orange County Public Schools with the welfare of our students constantly in mind. And I think one of the most exciting things is the, the transition to uh, understanding how important social emotional learning is. <coughs> Um, restorative justice, the, the role that the school district plays today in transforming the lives of our children, where just 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you tended to hear, it's not our problem, you know, kids come to us with problems, that's not our problem. I have never heard even anything resembling that in the last um, several months here, and it's just pretty awesome to see a whole organization who is, is focused on the entire child. Um, every single one of them. So on that note, thank you for the important work that you do every oh, day. Oh. Dr. Jenkins, I will leave it to you to end us. <laughs> I am so sorry because I thought what you said, Madam Chair, was a perfect way to end it. What I forgot to mention, <laughs> what I forgot to mention was um, Member Bird actually had a suggestion that has already been taken care of. Our code of conduct is now on our OCPS app. It's already awesome. 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 That, that would be the current version, not not the um, uh, renovated version, but um, already uploaded and a part of our app. Um, I, I am so encouraged by the discussion here tonight. New eyes, fresh ideas, as well as those who are experienced, helping us to improve what we do on behalf of teachers and our classrooms and learning, and uh, most importantly for our students. Been a very lively conversation. I think we have enough input that we can bring forward. Um, your red line uh, version by the time we get to uh, workshop. Thank you. So we are going to adjourn in just a minute. Before we do, let me announce that the board members here at present will convene upstairs in the superintendent's conference room for an executive session called by our legal counsel, Mr. Rodriguez. This meeting is now adjourned. Fine, good job, Jim. Very good. It's very good. Wonderful discussion. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Thank you all. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Yeah, Poor no, the basin. Base means a lot. Base and place. <laughs> Girl, y'all don't say me. God, this is me. Me, who? <laughs> I thank you.
Thank you. <laughs>